Hello and welcome to today's webinar, AdTech, Competitive Advantage Through a Better Database. My name is Matt Bichel. I will be serving as today's moderator. I am the Director of Product Marketing for Aerospike. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Our first presenter, our guest presenter, is Jim Nail. Jim is Principal Analyst for Forrester, serving B2C marketing professionals. Jim covers marketing measurement platforms, emerging tools, online and offline omni-channel touch points, as well as direct-to-consumer DTC brands. Our main presenter is Jonathan LeDuc. Jonathan is lead project manager at Addition. He is responsible for leading many integration projects for new customers at Addition. A little bit of housekeeping. Please feel free to enter questions into the platform. We'll be handling all Q&A at the end of the session. We will also be making slides and the recording available thereafter. So without any further ado, Jim, please take it away. Great, Matt, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today and pleasure to talk about um, how data and better databases can make advertising more effective. And in fact, not only for our own sakes, but for our consumers as well. And this topic of uh, applying better databases to marketing is, is a great one. It really fits Forrester's mantra, challenge thinking, lead change. We know how much change has been happening in the advertising and marketing world over the years. And that really does require challenging some of the uh, notions that have dominated the, the advertising and marketing world for, for many, many years. Uh, even those that grew up earlier in the digital advertising world. Uh, that today, again, need to be challenged, need to be updated, need to make sure that we as marketers are applying the latest technology, data, and best practices so that we can be as effective as possible with what we're with with our marketing. Um, kind of, you know, no surprise to anyone here. We've got all of these fantastic channels, both traditional and digital, out there now. Um, the good news. Uh, the bad news is it makes our lives as marketers uh, incredibly complicated trying to understand how each of these channels works, how to allocate our budgets across these channels, uh, you know, tracking how effective they all are. Um, but what technology gives us in terms of complexity, uh, technology also gives us the data to help understand all of those questions and then uh, manage effectively uh, how we're deploying these campaigns. And as a consequence of that, you know, digital advertising now accounts for more than half of advertising worldwide, uh, continuing to grow at a much faster uh, clip than uh, traditional advertising. But then we run into some problems. This, this was well covered uh, 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 over the last year or so, how P&G, the world's largest advertiser, um, has cut back on its uh, digital ad spending and quite frankly, finding uh, that A, it like didn't lose anything, but in fact, improved effectiveness, at least as measured by reach. Um, and this really is fundamentally a data story. Um, it started because uh, 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 P&G uh, has been a, been a big proponent of changing some of those traditional digital advertising practices that were, uh, uh, you know, kind of hidden, uh, not transparent, uh, a lot of data not shared from the uh, digital publishers back to the advertisers. And so, you know, Procter & Gamble felt that if they had better access to that data, they could make smarter decisions. The initial consequence was they found a lot of stuff that they were spending money on that just really wasn't working for them uh, the way that they wanted it to. And that has kind of spread to, you know, some other advertisers, as you can see Unilever here as well. Um, because what has has happened as all of these channels have proliferated and as marketers have tried to you know be in front of their consumers uh, as much as possible in all of these channels is you end up with a situation like this 
overload uh, that that marketers uh, impose on their consumers, uh, that consumers begin to push back against as this issue of ad age from probably a year or so ago said, are we heading to a world without ads because we're uh, creating so much uh, uh, clutter for consumers and causing them to you know, look for uh, how they can block those ads and you know, figure out why am I getting these ads following about me and what can I do about it? Uh, so consumers are pushing back on, again, this sort of first gen digital advertising um, uh, world. And as uh, more research is being done about you know, how to do this, you know, here Newstar did, I think, a very, very interesting study here that shows that after a certain point of frequency of the number of times a consumer is exposed to an ad, you're actually not getting uh, any uh, 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 benefit from it. You can see here um, the uh, retail impression delivery, so the, how many ads are going out there versus the conversion rate that actually peaks at two to five, stays pretty high from six to 10, drops down, you're on the top uh, set of bars, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and then after 20 exposures really starts to drop off. Uh, but on this bottom chart, you can see a significant number of uh, consumers here were exposed more than 30 times to that ad. And so that's why I say here, sometimes saying nothing is going to be the best thing that you can do for the effectiveness and efficiency of your ads. And how do you know when to say nothing? It comes down to the data. <laughs> it comes down to knowing how many times that consumer has been exposed to your messaging and making sure that you are controlling for that. Um, and this world, certainly we've got all the digital channels and more and more digital channels, it seems every day. And this world of data is now coming to television as well. Uh, this is another area that I cover here at Forrester that's been incredibly active this year, uh, starting early on this year when Viacom uh, acquired a, a streaming service called Pluto. Um, Viacom, of course, being the owner of CBS and many other uh, traditional TV properties. Um, and Pluto being an ad-supported streaming service. So Viacom uh, is seeing this world change and knowing that uh, consumers are going to be watching more and more programming on streaming services and they want their piece of it. But of course, once we've got people back into that digital environment, whether we're delivering you know, traditional content or this kind of long form television entertainment content, we have the ability to do, you know, better targeting, better frequency control, et cetera. Um, NBC coming up soon with that as well. Uh, Disney very actively out there. Amazon, in fact, just the other day announced a partnership uh, with the Trade Desk to help them manage connected TV uh, inventory you know, on their Amazon uh, uh, Prime video service. So very quickly, we're seeing more and more of this uh, come to this traditional television world uh, with again, Roku uh, moving very aggressively into, into advertising. And that's actually driving a lot of their revenue and certainly driving, as you can see here, uh, the stock price of the company as the Wall Street analysts look at that advertising revenue growth and go, hey, that's a great thing uh, for Roku. We want to buy in now while it's, uh, you know, while it's cheap, you know, buy low, sell high. Um, so this creates an additional environment, an additional area where programmatic uh, can apply. Um, you know, it's obviously over the last three or four years become really the dominant way of buying in uh, a, a lot of other digital forms, particularly display and things like that. Um, and when we talk to marketers and agency folks about, well, you know, what do you think is really the impact of programmatic? What's important to you? Um, they want to do things like improve targeting, 
improve effectiveness of media, increase transparency, better reach and frequency management, plan and execute marketing across all channels more seamlessly. And guess what? Underneath all of this is going to be data. It's the data that informs who you should be targeting. It uh, is the data that tells you is that is that uh, targeting strategy and is that placement effective? It's data that tells you, you know, is this a new person that I have not reached before? Or how many times has this person seen ads in this campaign? Um, and it's data that will, will tell you where can I best reach the consumers that I want to reach across all of these different choices I have uh, in channels. Um, so how do you do this? And this comes to one of Forrester's core themes that we've been talking about um, for, for a number of years here, this idea of customer obsession. Um, and here's the definition of this. I won't read it per se. Um, but again, I think this is one of these big changes that certainly many companies that I talk to and that my colleagues here talk to, companies that have traditionally been focused on their product, you know, and how do we improve the product or, you know, our distribution strategies and how do we, you know, get better distribution for those products. And what we're saying is those things still important, of course, but now you really have to focus on um, those customers that you want to reach you know, put that strategy energy and the business processes around who those customers are, what they want, how you can most effectively uh, uh, acquire, uh, retain and grow your relationship with them. And that you've got to have at least equal, if not higher emphasis on that than those traditional uh, 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 business uh, dimensions like distribution and, and product and things like that. And we've done a lot of uh, research here. We've got a very good body of research uh, around this. Um, and I'm going to take it and apply it here to this world of advertising and to the role of data in advertising. So the four core principles of being customer obsessed mean you need to be customer led. And this isn't just customer aware. This isn't like, oh, yes, we have customer relationships. Again, you have to obsess about those customers and not try to force on them what you think they need, but you need them to lead you and be able to listen to them and hear, well, what do they want from us and how do we then follow their lead? Again, this is a data story. You need the insights about the consumers and their behaviors and what they're doing in order to uh, then understand where they're leading you and then to be able to implement on that. And of course, in this world, it's everything's fast. Consumers have less and less attention, shorter and shorter attention spans. And so you've got to be able to process that information and uh, 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 be very agile then in evolving your strategies and adapting to it, um, which then requires that everything be connected um, so that you can uh, know where to find those consumers and make sure that you are delivering the right kinds of messages and things to them um, as well. Um, so let me take each one of those. And I'll go like one click down uh, into each of those. Customer led, um, you know, goes beyond demographics. And I know in marketing, that's the first thing we always start with. Um, but just because you know your customer is, you know, female uh, age uh, 18 to 49, uh, XYZ income and things like that doesn't mean that you know her well enough to be led by her. This is where marketing and customer experience and web design even uh, begin to intersect and overlap. These kinds of personas to sort of understand what's her motivations, what kind of things does she value? What is she trying to accomplish? Not just with your products, but kind of where those products fit in her life and her life goals are the kinds of things that give you that depth of knowledge about your customer so that you can allow your customer to lead you. The big one here is this idea of insights driven. And being insights driven means you base action in the data you have. Your decisions are rooted certainly in, in experience. You know, that still has value. Um, but you need to make sure that you check that uh, experience with data. So 
starting, of course, with all the basic uh, demographic things too, but adding in all of this amazing amount of data that we can get from you know, the digital world, like the interactions and the transactions and the response channels they work uh, in and, and the journeys they take across those channels, you know, from social things like sentiment, how are they feeling about you know, the company, the brand, the product these days, um, their affinities, uh, you know, the context, you know, where are they, what time of day is it, that can change what you might want to say to them as well. And this probably is the core, uh, you know, the core here uh, for, for this discussion, this idea of making sure that you are capturing this data, that you understand what data is valuable and what kind of data is useful to improve uh, your marketing, and then being able to deploy it uh, to improve your marketing effectiveness. And that's where connection comes in. You need that data to be able to connect, uh, understanding this journey from when they discover your brand, your product, your company, to whatever research exploration they go through. And then, you know, the, the transaction is not the end of that either. You want to build that relationship to understand how they use uh, the product, give them opportunities to ask other ways they can use the product or ways they can use it better to make uh, get more value for themselves from it and build that kind of engagement across all these different channels and things. So connecting that is really important too. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with kind of a high level look at this fits, how this fits within what we call them the model for modern marketing. And some things here, uh, I'm going to start on the outer ring where we say there are three key things marketing must do today customer understanding so that you can be customer led. Then you build a brand strategy to how you're going to uh, align with those customer needs, wants, and desires. And then you got to build that brand experience. And to do that requires these four uh, skill sets in the middle, the mindset, the process, the talent, and the insights. And they all kind of work together. But it's very much about that being data-driven and having a process that connects these things uh, and is fast. And these empowered consumers, we call them empowered consumers because we know they've got these devices, they've got the ability to uh, research and, and find us and our competitors and different opportunities to, to purchase our products. Um, and so they have an awful lot of power. And in order to be led by them, you need to be uh, obsessed with what they need from you, what they want from you, how they want to interact with you. And all of that requires great data in a great database, which is the handoff uh, to Jonathan. It's going to take us a click deeper into how you can uh, build that kind of data and then deploy it in your marketing campaigns. So Jonathan, over to you. All right. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate your time there. Um, yeah. So hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here, Matt. Thanks, Jim, uh, for having me here. I'm uh, happy to be here and to share the story and the value um, that we get out of using Aerospike. We, um, well, we'll start here. So uh, what I'm going to do here today, so we're Addition, we're an ad serving company here out of Germany. So I'm going to go through sort of, I just want to tell the story of, of where we're coming from and why we've uh, we've landed very happily with Aerospike here. So just give me a second here to... Okay, so here's a quick overview of uh, sort of what we can expect. So we're just gonna, it's not a long talk. We're gonna start about kind of who we are as a company so everyone's comfortable with uh, where we're coming from and what our goals are. We're gonna then talk about some of the previous database solutions we tried. Uh, and then we're going to talk about our experiences with Aerospike and some of the value and all the benefits we're receiving from them now. And then we'll just sort of sum everything up and go into a Q&A. So who are we? Well, here at Edition, so we're a, a German company. We Everything sort of started here in 2001. Uh, we officially became Edition in 2004. Um, we offer ad delivery services, uh, subscription services to 
tons of customers here across Germany. Um, right. Uh, in addition, we have about 80 employees. We're spread across five different locations throughout Switzerland and the UK as well. And uh, most of us are based out of uh, Freiburg, which is in the southwest. Um, we have uh, here in the bottom left, our marketing team uh, drafted up these slides here for us. Um, a big part of our sales pitch here is very important to everyone is to make sure that we're, uh, we're always sticking to the GDPR as uh, general data privacy uh, regulations here. It's a European standard. Uh, so yeah, we adhere very strictly to that to make sure that, uh, that we're doing as everything we can. Uh, and typically what we offer in the ad serving industry is sort of a digital marketing, uh, the services that handle all of this advertising. So it's a, mostly it's a fully automated programmatic uh, database driven marketing system. And we can do it across, we service across all channels. So there's digital at a home. Uh, which is sort of a large scale video. We also do um, in stream, which is much smaller videos, sort of something you might see on YouTube while you're watching a video. And uh, we also offer display banners, and uh, I think there's a few more as well. So we kind of offer so, sort of the whole gamut. If you can imagine going on your iPhone and surfing the internet and seeing an ad uh, at a website or in an app, this is some of the services that we offer. Uh, so, it, addition is actually just one part of a much bigger family uh, called Virtual Minds. And so in Virtual Minds, we actually have several companies that help connect uh, all ends of the spectrum, all the way from the, the uh, supply side to the demand side uh, of the whole industry. So we're able to offer services to everyone. I'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, we also offer... Uh, I'm not not a big fan of this comment down at the bottom, but we a few of the different formats we offer HTML5, we do in-page, in-stream, we do outstream, in mobile, dynamic video. There's we have to stick to the vast standard, so there's we kind of we kind of cover a pretty wide uh, a wide gamut of services there. So just a little more about the Virtual Minds umbrella I mentioned uh, a little bit ago. So in the middle there is us, we're Edition. Uh, so we handle targeting and uh, ad serving, we actually supply most of the digital infrastructure for the demand side, which is to the right a little bit, you'll see active agent, uh, programmatic buying. Programmatic is a fancy word for sort of an automated auction style uh, format for uh, selecting advertisements and delivering them. And then on the left side, the supply side, this is sort of uh, closer to uh, the, 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 the side of the auctions where a lot of the publishers um, will participate. So the publishers, we're going to be the websites uh, down on the left, or on the left, I guess, the, just the websites that are actually supplying the advertisements. And then the demand side is going to be all the advertisers and the people looking to advertise. Uh, and then we also have AdClear and AdX, which are sort of complementary services as well. Of course, we need a database uh, services uh, using AdX, and uh, that's part of part of why we're here. And so that's kind of a, a over, overview of sort of the company that we're in and, and, uh, and sort of how we fit into the bigger picture of things here. So yeah, cutting edge design or cutting edge technology, privacy by design. I guess these are some of the buzzwords that we like to use. 100% uh, made in Germany. I laughed about this one today because we actually have, uh, in the previous slide we mentioned how we have uh, Switzerland and uh, we also have people from the UK, but I guess it all still goes through us and we all still make the decision and uh, this is important to us. So um, yeah, so that's addition. Uh, and here are some of the customers that we, we service here as well. So these may or may not be familiar to the, to the American marketplace. Uh, we have auto, which is a, you can think of them like Amazon here in Deutschland, in Germany. Uh, they're a pretty large uh, online store. And there's also Payback up in the top there is uh, actually owned by Amex. So that's sort of a rewards program. And there's uh, ING Direct as a bank. Uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with that by now. And Eins und Eins is actually, you can think of them as a internet provider, a service provider here in Germany. So that's just some of the customers we have. We have actually far more than that. Some of them um, are, are not on the list, but yeah. So this is some of the customers that we provide. So. Maybe by now we'll have a, a better idea of sort of what we offer here at Edition. So generally, what are our needs when it comes to uh, managing our databases? Well, we have six different data centers 
uh, and we're servicing, we deliver bid requests in these real-time SSP auctions all across Germany and, and beyond. And so we need it to be low latency, we need low downtime, we just need it to work. And uh, so that sort of uh, starts off our, our story here. So originally, when we were first looking, how are we going to solve this problem? We tried a few a few other uh, a few other providers first. So let's get into some of the previous solutions. We first used uh, back in 2010 when we first really started to to, to develop uh, the, this type of the, the need for the service to uh, a greater extent. Um, yeah, we were using Dynamite, which is a, actually an open source uh, product online, uh, and um, yeah, it was our first uh, first gen key value storage. But ultimately, the the developers, the guys who were working on it, ended up abandoning it and uh, moving on, and they actually uh, started working on React. And so we went to React, and we gave them a try. And it was okay. I sat down with some of the, the developers uh, that were right at the cutting edge of this transition at the time, and they sort of gave me a nice picture of what it was like. They said, you know, it was all right, but it, there were a couple incidents where it started to get slow, and there wasn't a lot of understanding as to why or what was happening. So they noticed when we were moving things between nodes within these clusters, it would make the whole cluster slower as a whole. And this sort of was something that we weren't so comfortable with. And then um, when the clusters, when a node would actually go down and the clusters needed to fail over um, to, to the other nodes and rebalance the load, then uh, things would just slow right down. And then even when the node would finally return and uh, the, the, all of the load across the cluster was being rebalanced, even this process was slow. So it, every time any of this type of uh, massive usage or node failover situations had to happen. It was quite a quite a problem for us on our side. And then it sometimes couldn't even it wouldn't even be able to automatically return back to normal running state uh, once it would come back up. Um, there was times when we had to actually disable uh, some of the services that were using the cluster. So, for example, our targeting wouldn't work for a little while. We'd actually have to disable the service and then once the the whole cluster was able to restart and come back up then we would then only then would would everything be able to to begin resuming again and so this is obviously a big problem for us if this is going to take even an hour or two or three this is a this is a lot of money sometimes that can happen when when these services go down so this is a big problem um we tried correcting some of the disk data uh to see if there was anything we could do and this was also a problem and Often we would need to actually, in order to to get these clusters of these nodes back up, we would actually have to manually delete links and uh, kind of really get our hands dirty. And it was it became a manual process uh, to get everything back up and running. So we would, for example, at one point we tried changing the storage format when it was slow to see if that would help speed it up. And it was okay for another three months or so, and then and then everything started to happen again. So we were optimistic originally with React, but then it just sort of didn't didn't work for us for too many reasons, so we ended up having to move on. And then we went and we thought, okay, so where are we going to go next? At this point, we sort of had an idea. Okay, well, we can't handle this kind of leg. This is too costly for us, so we need to get you know 99% of requests back within five milliseconds. We gave ourselves some sort of uh, boundary there. So we went to Cassandra, and this was. Uh, this was okay. The first requests were okay when when we got everything set up and everything configured. It seemed to be all right. But then once we actually inserted data at scale, then it really started to slow down significantly. There was uh, whenever it was updating values or it was changing any kind of data, it was very laggy, and it was sometimes ongoing, continuous, and we tried changing some parameters as well with this one. And uh, yeah, unfortunately with Cassandra, it, it ultimately just most of the time was just too slow. And so we had to look elsewhere. So at that point, we, uh, we'd we become aware of Aerospike. And so we, we jumped in and immediately we were thrilled. Uh, our dev said he was, he was excited to say, we just turn it on and it just works. He said there was very little tuning, it just worked as it was supposed to. 
it was almost miraculous. It was way better than anyone had expected. They at least expected, you know, quite a few customizations or something to get everything up and running to the point where it worked for us. But he said, no, I just turned it on and it just worked. <laughs> so that was a, a, we were thrilled about this. Um, it was very easy and apparently, um, you know, when it comes to maintenance, it's it's also very straightforward. It's um, apparently, uh, for example, when React was down a node and had to rebalance across the cluster, there was a lot of reorganization and it was very slow. And this was encumbering with Aerospike. There's we have pretty much no experience of this. If it, I think it does happen on the background, but uh, it doesn't. We don't get impacted by it at all. So uh, yeah, it, it, so far it's had it's, it's handled all of the the scale we were able to throw at it. And uh, yeah, it's just been been wonderful. At one point, we actually had uh, two complete power losses on our side, and we were when, with using Aerospike and services all. Normally, when this happens, you can look at a, an hour or two or three for things to come back up. But everything with Aerospike was back up and running within 40 minutes, without any issue. Everything was ready to go again. So yeah, we were pretty thrilled with uh, with Aerospike right off the bat. And uh, so here's a slide with, uh, I actually just took this information earlier today, this afternoon, right in the middle of the day, um, right when uh, activity is somewhat high. And uh, so this is just one of the, of the nodes that we, we have. I think we have uh, nine different clusters with Aerospike that are spread out across, maybe I have that on the next slide. Mm. Well, we have, yeah, nine different clusters of 37 different nodes. This is just one of the nodes on one of the clusters. Um, this is the one that's a little more active, so it's a little more interesting to look at. But yeah, as we can see, we have, we can throw a ton of, these are just the writes per second. We, we do more of that, I think, than we do the reading, uh, at least on this particular node. And as you can see here, there's under a millisecond of lag for, and this is a 30 minutes uh, data here. So like even when there was a spike in the information, no problem. So this is for us. This is a this is a pretty pretty excellent experience. It's our our guys have been able to pretty much just set it and forget it, and, and uh, everything is good. So um, yeah, we use the the uh, enterprise version of Aerospike. Um, some of the the value that we really get out of it is the fast restart. So, uh, for example, this is uh, the, a concept where the, the data that is, that is used in the application is actually in some way separated from the software. So then if the, it actually stays in memory, so then with the fast restart, only the application itself is restarted, software is left alone. And so this makes the whole, the, the whole restart experience down, brings it down to seconds. So this is a huge value add for us as well. Um, yeah, the management console we get we get uh, we get more statistics, more data, and that makes it way easier for us to do debugging when we're looking at our uh, servers to, and their nodes to see if there's any issues. And uh, yeah, the commercial support. I mean, we can't really can't really question that. You know, Aerospike was very helpful uh, whenever we've needed to to you know consult with them on anything. It's been just nice to have you guys around. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, there we go. So how do we use it now? So this is the results. Where do, what kind of life do we live today? Well, we use it for, these are some of the, the data storages. We use it for a tagging data store, a DMP one, uh, which is through ADEX. We use it for container tags. We use it for our frequency capping. There's a lot of data there. And uh, so we use it across, uh, so often for one request, we'll be consulting all of these multiple stores simultaneously at the same time. And so with Aerospike, we don't even have to question that reliability. Uh, yeah, so there we go. So we're using nine clusters. Uh, this is over two of our data centers uh, that we use, um, dedicated for these services uh, with 37 nodes. So total, those, those nodes added up with the other ones. I think actually this is 100,000. I think it's more up to 150 or 200,000 read and writes. I was looking at it again. Uh, just the other day. So these are transactions per second. So we uh, have quite a lot of volume uh, that we're using with Aerospike. And I think we're using around four terabytes of data spread out over all those clusters. So um, 
Yeah, so I mean, we've uh, when we first started before we were using Aerospike, I think we were down in half or even less than half of the uh, the amount of transactions per second that we're able to do now. So yeah, we've uh, noticed a huge increase in that since since we started using Aerospike back in 2015. Uh, and um, we were looking for some more precise data to actually draw comparisons between our experience with Aerospike now and with some of those older ones. Um, but uh, it was too ambiguous and we weren't able to really put our finger on anything. But um, as a whole, since we started using Aerospike, we've grown about just over 20% uh, since 2015, which is pretty exciting, I think, and pretty good. And I know that Aerospike has had a huge part to play because well, we were using those old uh, those old solutions. There was a lot of there was a lot of weight on our on our devs to try and they were just spending a lot of time doing maintenance and trying to do risk mitigation as opposed to actually being able to focus on new products and moving forward. And ever since we set up shop with Aerospike, we haven't even had to look back. We don't even really think about it anymore. So we're thrilled to be using Aerospike. And uh, yeah, they're at the bottom. So we deliver one and 1.5 billion ads per day. That originally said two. I think it's 1.5. It fluctuates a little bit, but uh, yeah, I think we're we're delivering right now 1.5 billion ads per day. And you can imagine that that's just the delivery. So these are online auctions. So a lot of these bid requests that are happening, that some of them don't necessarily make it to the point where we deliver an ad. So yeah, we're processing a ton of volume uh, with Aerospike, and yeah, we barely even have to look at the at the console anymore. So we're we're thrilled. So I just want to take a moment to say, you know, that's our story that we have with with you guys with Aerospike. We're you know, we're very happy customers and thanks uh, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to our experience with you guys. So thank you and with that, Matt, I'll hand things back over to you. Great. Thank you both Jonathan and Jim. Uh, really insightful stuff. It's it's, it's it was really Interesting to hear that uh, presentation uh, live, if you will. So um, at this point, I will take questions from our audience. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and ask them as I come in. Uh, first question, I, I, uh, Jim, back earlier in your presentation, uh, this question is says, uh, P&G cut their digital ad spending 10%, yet they increase the results. How can this be? Uh, there were actually a number of factors that went into that. Now, P&G started, uh, you know, taking this really close scrutiny of their ad budgets back in 2017, which was at the height of the concern about, you know, fraud and bots and, and all of that sort of stuff. So the first thing they, you know, they did when they got the data uh, about, uh, uh, about what was happening with their advertising is they were able to, you know, cut spending that was, uh, you know, either going to those fraudulent sites or that was not viewable, things like that, that, you know, obviously would have zero impact. If a human being doesn't see it, it ain't going to do anything for your business. Um, so that was kind of where they started. Um, and then they reinvested that. And quite frankly, they reinvested a lot of that money back into traditional media. Um, you know, they still find that, you know, while everyone likes to say TV is dead and no one watches TV anymore, you know, that's that's really not the case. Uh, and so they found that they had sort of over pivoted and pushed too much money into digital, at least for their, um, you know, their particular product categories. Again, you know, these are product categories where people, you know, often don't think a lot about them. They're not doing a ton of online research. And so that just classic brand awareness uh, uh, type of strategy is, is effective for them. Um, but no one should take that as a sign that Procter & Gamble doesn't believe in digital advertising or data. Um, that would be absolutely the wrong conclusion to take because the other thing that Mark Pritchard, their CMO, is famous for saying is he believes the future is mass reach with precision targeting. And of course, the way you're going to get precision targeting is is with data. So it's really more a matter of you know kind of learning and learning best practices and learning what in the early days uh, you know they've been doing wrong or sort of you know have rushed in very enthusiastically and um, just got to constantly improve the way that you're you're managing these things. So it puts the onus on companies like like Addition to make sure their ads are effective. And but the overall 
fund redeployment indicated that the business overall did better. It wasn't that their ad, ads were performing better. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And I think that's where, okay. um, where I think a lot of, you know, companies in the ad tech space, um, you know, have a real opportunity to be good partners with those advertisers by making sure they have access to the data and probably helping them, you know, interpret some of that data to, to make their marketing decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know some, sometimes, you know, there's companies that police ad placement, so they actually can verify, Hey, your, mm -hmm. your ads were placed. So there's, there's no fraud on, on poor placement. Yep. Numbers. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's good. I, I kind of have a similar question myself. Uh, next question up uh, is for Jonathan. Uh, user says, "Hey, I thought Cassandra was good at scaling and actually known for it. What, what were your issues with Cassandra?" Yeah, like I said a little about a while ago, as soon as we we scaled up, things started to really hang up for us. It, it was almost everywhere. It, what we we ended up kind of figuring out was that the, it's a distributed design that, that Cassandra uses. And so with this, um, they they have to use tombstoning um, in order to kind of keep everything clean and to, to sort of clean up the disk. Uh, and this process is, it's kind of always has to be running in the background. And it was the source of what a lot of the problems that we ended up having were. And, you know, if we, if we, if we needed to less data and less, uh, volume, I think it wouldn't have been a problem, but for the amount that we needed, it was just, it was too much. So once, uh, yeah, I mean, and and it, uh, almost everything was bogged down by this process, reading, writing, you know, yeah, it, it, unfortunately it was just, I guess it sort of, ultimately it, we kind of brought everything down to the tombstoning uh, defrag format as what the source of the problem was. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunate, but I guess good good for uh, Aero Spike to come in. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Next question is to Jim. As an ad tech supplier, how can I advise my customers when the reach curve is approached uh, or when they're approaching diminishing returns? And as a follow-up is wouldn't I want – uh, to place more ads, you know, if I'm making money as an ad tech supplier. Yeah, well, that last statement is the, the reason we've got into the problem where Procter & Gamble has to stand up and say they're cutting their budgets um, because, you know, certainly, and I, I certainly understand the, the need for a business to grow its revenue, particularly, you know, an early stage, you know, business, you know, VC funded business like many ad tech platforms, you know, have been in the past and, and still are. Um, but, you know, if you want to have a long term uh, sustainable business, um, you, you have to balance your own interests with those of your customers. Um, so, and as we saw with that data early on, and, and, and this is nothing new, I mean, this is standard to classic advertising. Uh, uh, a knowledge that uh, uh, frequency, once you get to a certain point of frequency, um, people have gotten your message. They, you know, they understand you, they know who you are, you, and they know it, what you do. And any additional exposure really doesn't get you uh, anything else. Um, now in television, that's traditionally been about, you know, between four and six impressions, as we saw, um, with that data from Newstar in the digital world, it does tend to be higher, but uh, you get up to that 20, 30 range and it varies, you know, it's, it's particular to a product category and to uh, different brands. So that's something that, um, you know, I'm not sure the ad tech supplier can tell uh, the, uh, uh, the advertiser that they've hit that frequency level, but you know, that's where sharing that kind of data uh, and understanding what the advertisers' uh, goals and things are, so that together you can work together to, you know, create a successful advertising uh, 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 campaign, which will then come back with more advertising, you know, in new campaigns and new products and things like that, versus, you know, trying to get, 
you know, more money from that one campaign, you know, after yeah. that point of, of diminishing returns. Uh, and yeah, that think, idea, you know, re reach it, you know, that, that idea that like, if I can reach one more person who has not seen the ad, you know, that is far more valuable to me hmm. than showing the, you know, 21st, 22nd, 30th ad to somebody who's, who's, you know, being bombarded by me. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I also think almost in a way from what I understand is that the, the label ad tech almost does a disservice because there's a lot of advisement uh, that the companies hmm. do. It's not just, not just, you know, mechanical or automatic placement. So uh, yeah. that's, a, that's yeah. a good uh, description. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, oh, well, we'll bounce back to Jonathan. Uh, that same person kind of had a follow-up question saying, hey, when you're facing these scaling issues with Cassandra, you know, what did Cassandra support have to say about this issue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we uh, actually one of our developers did get in touch with one of the representatives uh, from DataStax about it, uh, and they kind of bounced back and forth a lot, and we were looking at everything. But yeah, at the end, I think even they confirmed, yeah, just the requirements are just too steep. It's just much scale. It's not designed for that. And uh, yeah, I don't. I wish we could. Uh, I wish we had a quote of that somewhere. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, that was that's how that sort of that time ended. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, okay. Um, pretty, pretty cut and dry. Um, okay. Next question, uh, Jim. Uh, for programmatic advertisers, what can, or I'm sorry, where and how can an ad tech company advise a customer? Where in the customer journey their ad should be placed? So I kind of take that as you know, are they? Hmm. Kind of just looking are they pretty close to buying are they like about to buy uh, where are they in the funnel so yep. you know where have yep. you seen yep. advertisers advise uh customers? that's Thanks. yeah i mean that that's a really great question and i hear you know, a lot more thinking going into that um because you know that idea of frequency um you know typically today it's kind of the same message or a small pool of different executions of that same message that when you get up into that 20, 30, et cetera, uh, frequency level, you, you lose effectiveness. The, you know, the alternative is, and, and I can't say that I've seen a ton of examples of this yet, but a lot of people are exploring this, is you know, maybe after that fifth or 10th or 12th impression of one uh, uh, message, um, you change the message and take them kind of deeper into what your brand promises or what what your benefits are or just basically enrich their understanding and you you build that kind of sequence of messaging um so that it isn't just hammering people with the same old thing all the time that they get sick of um yeah. but here again i think this this also requires uh really good cooperation between uh, the ad tech and the advertiser, because the advertiser, hey, when someone comes to your website, or maybe they've seen that someone has gone and searched, you know, for their brand after they've seen an ad, all of those things do indicate that people are at a different point of the customer journey or of knowledge about about the brand, and that there's an opportunity then to to mix up the messaging, uh, and instead of annoying people with the same old thing, give them value by saying. Hey, here's something you might not know about us, or here's another uh, yeah. uh, benefit that you can get from us in addition to the ones that we've been telling you about already. Yeah, no, real, real marketing advisement there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, let's see. Next question is for Jonathan. How much time does the team spend keeping AirSpike running compared to the prior solutions like Cassandra, React, or even Dynamite? Yeah, none. <laughs> we, uh, I guess I kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but yeah, when we were using uh, Cassandra, React, yeah, I mean, we were pouring a lot of effort and time just into just maintaining that and trying to find ways of making it work and trying to adapt it to our system and trying to figure out what each of the quirks were of each of them so that you know we can kind of 
come up with some sort of workflow to build it into uh, you know our our everyday life and yeah with aerospike we don't even have to think about it nobody barely even has to think twice i think we look at the consoles everything looks green and you know yeah it's it's indisputable for us yeah yeah it kind of makes me like think of like okay so what are those people doing that they don't you know what are they doing now they don't have to keep keep the system up all the time what are they doing <laughs> exactly. with the free time <laughs> and now they're able to focus on new, like actually expanding the company and building new functionality as opposed to just keeping the, you know, the way it running. Now we're actually <laughs> look out there. There you go. That sounds, yeah. I'm sure it's a lot more fun um, for those people. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the answer. Um, okay. Uh, final question is to Jim. Um, Interesting. Uh, as an ad tech supplier, how do I advise my customers that I can map to their demographics? Uh, how do you find these uh, suppliers constructing their uh, personas? You know, are they connecting to third-party data sources all the time, or are using their own data? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's definitely a mix of both. I, I have seen in the last probably a uh, year or so the. Uh, uh, tendency toward using more and more first party data. Um, there's a lot of not great quality third party data out there. And I think a number of advertisers have been, you know, have been burned by that. Um, uh, so, so they're, they're, they're using more and more of their first party data, but you know, at some point they need to acquire new customers too. Right. So uh, sure. it can't just all be, you know their their first party data, and then you do have companies like uh, you know Procter and Gamble, you know which doesn't have a uh, a direct relationship you know with with their uh, with their consumers per se, and they they're doing a lot to build a database, um, but they're not going to have as rich uh, first party data as you know other kinds of of products or, or different kind of categories will have. So you know some of that uh, you know third party data. Um, is valuable, um, and you know the the question here came in a, a bit of skewed toward demographics, and yeah, that's not necessarily what marketers are trying to do, uh, particularly in that world of television. When I talk to advertisers about their connected TV strategies, but quite frankly, this is even you know invading traditional linear TV strategies as well. They want to get beyond that old construct of you know, women 18 to 49 or adults 25 right. to 54, um, they really want to get a lot closer to um, what they call their strategic target. Um, and for example, I was talking with a baby products company uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they, they mentioned that there are 8 million diapering moms in the country. So they want to reach diapering moms, right? Um, yeah. How do you define that? Well, you know, it's here presence of children under the age of say three. Um, so it's still kind of a demographic, but going beyond. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what the age of the mother is. is. Yeah, exactly, long they have. exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know, to, to stick with P&G for a second, uh, a brand like Pampers, which is, you know, positioning itself as the you know highest quality. It's probably a little premium priced compared to some other brands in there. You know, their messaging is around, you know, you want to do the best for babies, so you you should put them in Pampers. Um, so maybe there's some other uh, things you could look for, like people who have bought like really high end strollers, right? Or, you know, they bought the baby Einstein stuff, which shows that they really are, you know, thinking a lot about how they can give their their baby the best, you know? So there might be some attitudinal, you know, behavioral things that indicate those kinds of attitudes um, that would uh, uh, give the, the, those advertisers a little bit finer segmentation. Okay, good, okay. All right, well, hey, we are, uh, we are right at the hour pretty much. So um, I wanted to both thank uh, presenters for their time. Uh, if people have additional questions, I'm more than happy to route them uh, to them. I do encourage those uh, that uh, we will have a recording available as well as the slides for download. Uh, I do encourage you to check out Aerospike's uh, ad tech information 
and you can see our solution brief and ebook make for a good uh, look through. Uh, feel free to look at our other customers uh, in the ad tech space. Uh, so with that, I will wish uh, all of our uh, listeners uh, a good rest of their day. And again, uh, a hearty thank you to our presenters.